Okay, how's everybody doing? Good. Yeah. Even though it's cold, windy, foggy, we're still here. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, my name is Keanu. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I have a PhD in political science. So my area of focus is international relations and public law. Okay. Uh, my doctor dissertation and, and publications address Hawaii's continued existence as a country. So I'm very familiar with international law. One in particular area is called the law of occupation. And that's what we're going to talk about today. How does the law of occupation apply to Hawaii since 1893 till today? And in light of what's going on, I think it's important to know really some of the terminology so that people, when they make a decision, it's more informed and not reactionary, right? Um, so in light of what may or may not occur, it's good to know what's going on, yeah? So what I'm going to be doing is uh, making reference to these documents. I have to admit, I didn't have time to go and make copies at UH because I was on this island. I teach on Oahu. <laughs> Last time I would hand out copies. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be pointing to it, and the videographer is going to have this information on the video once it's uploaded. That way you folks can actually see what's there. Yeah, you don't need to have a copy in hand. But also where to get that that information. Um, okay, so when we talk about international law, right? International law is not operated in the same way as you would understand typical laws in a country, right? So when you, when you speak of laws in a country, naturally people tend to look to a legislature. They create law, right? A bill that becomes an act, a resolution that becomes a joint resolution. Okay, so at the international level, you don't have that. You don't have a legislative body. Okay, some people think the United Nations makes laws. Actually, they don't. The United Nations is merely an organization of countries that have joined it. It's like a club, right? And their purpose is to hopefully resolve disputes before they blow up, right? Uh, take positions on issues that are affecting uh, people and countries, trade and so forth. It's, it's, it's called peaceful resolutions, trying to discuss how to do things. Now, whenever the United Nations passes a resolution, you notice it's not a law. It's called a resolution. A resolution is not a law. A resolution is a position statement, a position taken by people. So, like, let's say some of you may be involved with maybe a club, maybe a civic club and uh, they pass a resolution, right? When you pass a resolution, it's merely a statement that the club, its membership, is taking a particular position. It's not something that you can enforce, right? It's just a position statement, that's all it is. And the same thing would apply to American law. So when the United States Congress passes a joint resolution, right, which is an agreement between House and Senate, or the House and Senate may have its own resolution called a Senate resolution or a House resolution. All they're doing is taking a position, taking a position. It's not carrying it out where the president is going to execute the law, right? You cannot execute a resolution. That's just a position statement. So what's interesting is in 1898, the United States Congress passed a joint resolution to annex Hawaii, right? A joint resolution. Now, right there is an indication. All it is is a position statement taken by the Congress that they're annexing a foreign country. Not that it had any effect, because in order to carry that into effect, what you need is international law. Now, international laws do not have resolutions. So that's my segue into what is international law, and then also what is the law of occupation, which is a part of international law. Okay, so right off the bat, International law, if you look at the term inter, the word inter, it means between, right? Intra means within. So when you say international law, it's literally the law between nations, not within nations, okay? The laws within nations are called domestic law. Uh, another word, uh, national laws. Uh, another word, municipal law. Those laws apply within the territory of a country. International law applies outside of the country. And international law, uh, in the case of annexation, you need a treaty, you need an agreement 
between one country who is ceding its territory or country to the receiving country, right? And that's called ceded lands, okay? But you need a treaty where one will cede territory to the other. Once one cedes territory, that treaty becomes the evidence that something was transferred. Now, when you see a joint resolution of annexation annexed Hawaii, it's only a position statement and it's unilateral. It's like one side is claiming we got you, but there's nothing from the other side giving anything to you. Does that make sense? Okay. So a treaty of annexation or treaty of cession, which is called, ends up being called ceded lands, right? A treaty of cession is a bilateral agreement. That's what's important. And it's just like a, a deed. So if somebody wants to sell property, right? Well, let's use the example here. That road, right? That road was Hawaiian Homes Road. I'm not saying whether they legally own it. I'm just using it as an example. So that road over there, up to Mauna Kea, is on Hawaiian homelands. And then people were finding out, how did the Department of Transportation get the road? Well, you need an agreement. You need some transfer, some evidence of transfer. It's called a deed, right? Where one will transfer the territory to another. So you don't have to try to argue who owns the road. You just got to pull up the deed. Oh, they own it, right? That's the same thing with international law. And what the deed, what the treaty also signifies is the consent on both sides. It's not one side. Both are agreeing. Okay, so an example of a, a treaty of session was uh, between the United States and France in 1803, also called the Louisiana Purchase, right? Where France ceded territory west of the Mississippi River and adjacent to the territory, uh, adjacent to the land or the territory of Mexico to the United States. So prior to 1803, that area west of the Mississippi, before 1803, only French laws applied, French municipal law, yeah? French national law, French domestic law. After 1803, transferred to the United States, now American law applies, right? Whether it's a joint resolution, whether it's a territorial act. And the one thing about American law, which includes the joint resolution, it's not only unilateral, where one side is saying, we got it, when there's no evidence of somebody giving it, that law itself, which is an American law, is limited to U.S. territory, okay? So any law that is passed by any country under international law has no effect beyond its borders, okay? That's, that's number one, okay? Now, what has effect beyond countries' borders, we call that international law. And one example, as I shared, was treaties, or were treaties, okay? Now, there was also, let, let me give a, uh, the history of international law, where it actually came from. 1648, 1648, a little over 100 years before Kamehameha was born, okay? 1648, in Europe, Europe used to be run by what was called the Holy Roman Empire, right? They used to run Europe. And all of the, the prince, the kings, they were all under the Roman Empire emperor, right? But then what you started to have was the introduction of Protestant faith. See, the Holy Roman Empire was Catholic, right? You had the Protestants, and that eventually erupted into wars between these European entities, right? French, I mean, the, um, the Protestants against the Catholics, the Catholics against the Protestant. And that war went on for, for 30 years, okay? In 1648, the war ended through consecutive treaties where it was understood that each country, well, each entity would now be recognized as its own country, not as a part of the Holy Roman Empire. And that each country had a determination on what religion they will have within their territory. So that was the compromise, Catholics over here, Protestants over there, right? What, end, what ended up happening was these countries had to figure out how to work amongst each other because that this idea of states, independent states today, it actually goes back to 1648. That's when it was given birth, okay? This idea of what we know today as international law. So what ends up happening is you don't have a legislature 
in 1650 making international law that would bind all of these new sovereign countries, right? They had to work it out. And that's what we call customary international law. Customary. And customary, what that means is it becomes a customary law. Let's say all of us are part of our, our own countries. It becomes customary law and binding if every single one of us agree to it, right? That becomes custom. And it has just as much power as a treaty. So uh, a, a sense of customary international law would be two countries fighting each other in Europe, and one country is trying to send people over to negotiate a, a peaceful settlement. And they keep killing the guys when they come over, right? That eventually grew into what is called diplomatic immunity. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger, he's trying to end the conflict, right? And that became accepted. So that's a custom, right? So gradually everybody or all these European countries began to accept these aspects of customary international law, which is the foundation of of international law. From the custom, right, they can then get into specific international laws called, I'll negotiate a treaty with this country, and I'm gonna deal with migration, or I'm gonna deal with trade, right? Now that treaty is only binding on those countries that signed the treaty, but if that treaty represents something that's already understood customarily, it binds everybody. Am I making sense? Okay, so that's why you don't find a, a legislature at the international level. You got to find custom. Is it being followed, right? So within this system gradually grew this idea that these countries who are subjects of international law, law between nations, and you got to be recognized in the country. It, it, what was going on in Europe in the 1700s wouldn't apply in China. Yeah, because China was not part of that European construct, right? It wouldn't have applied in Hawaii, right? But it applied only to those who are making up this, this entity that has come, that will become to be known as the family of nations. And then gradually other countries around the world, outside of Europe, they want to be in that family. Because if you're in that family, you're equal to that family member, right? So that's why uh, Gandhi from India in the 1940s, he knew that his way out of British control was for India to become an independent state and join the family of nations. So you got people outside of Europe that began to actively move toward becoming a part of that family. And right now, the majority of the countries, members of this family of nations, are non-European. Okay? So the Hawaiian Kingdom, in 1893, there were only 44 countries that were part of this family of nations. Hawaii was one of them, right? Did you know today there's 197 countries? 193 of them are members of the United Nations because they used to be a colony or a possession of one of those 44 countries and they became decolonized, right? So like, um, let's take a look at uh, East Timor. So East Timor used to be a Portuguese colony. It became an independent state, okay? Um, Japan and China were not a colony of any European powers, but they were, they were prevented from entering the family because they were claiming, oh, you guys are not Christian. Oh, you, you know, so it gets on that, that Christianity card, right? But also, did you know, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, they were prevented from coming in. But after the Ottoman Turks had beat Western powers in the Crimean conflict, then they got to deal with them. See, now they're bringing them in. And Japan... After Japan defeated Russia, right, in the Russo-Japanese War, then it went, oh, Japan, okay. Then, so they actually came in by force, not by invitation. So this history of the family of nations is unique unto itself. And the one thing that I would caution people to do or not to do, don't pass judgment on something that you don't understand yet. Because our kupuna, back then in 1843, they endeavored to secure recognition of Hawaii as an independent state. They weren't swindled by the foreigner to do that because Hawaii was actually the first non-European country on its own to become a member of the family of nations. We were brown, but we were Christian, <laughs> right? So when Kamehameha pursued that, that was an important step. That is exactly what Palestine is trying to get today. Palestinians are not European, and they're fighting for their independence. 
here Hawaii was able to get it in 1843. That you never forget. And that day, November 28th, is called Independence Day, La Kuokoa. It's a holiday, which by the way, is on the same day this year as Thanksgiving. November 28th, it's not November 27th, I love that. So what you guys gotta do, don't throw the turkey in the oven, throw it in the emu. <laughs> and celebrate La Kuokoa, right? Because people like Timoteo Ha'alilio, William Richards, Sir Jordan Simpson, Matayo Kikuanaua, John E.E., e., they were all part of that. And they knew they had to do it. In fact, Matayo Kikuanaua sent a letter after Hawaii gets taken over by Lord Paulette, right? Because they're looking at Hawaii getting rogue. They're like doing things on their own. They're not acting British anymore. Matayo sends a letter to Timoteo in Europe before the formal recognition of Hawaiian independence. It says, we've just been taken over by a, Brit by a British naval officer, Lord Paulette. You have to succeed in your mission. And even said, even if you die. Now that gives an indication how important that was to the leadership of the Hawaiian kingdom at that time. This wasn't about missionaries controlling anybody. That's not true. It was about Hawaiians taking control of their own destiny, right? So now that Hawaii is a part of the family of nations, okay? During this time, you have what is called two state of affairs. Just got to make sure I'm on time with my... <laughs> so we started at 940, okay, so we're still good. <laughs> so within international law, or international relations, you have what is called two state of affairs. You have what is called the state of peace, right? Where countries are at peace, they negotiate treaties, commercial trade, migration, whatever. But then you also have what is called a state of war. Something could trigger two or more countries into a state of war. Now, once it's triggered into a state of war, different laws apply that wouldn't apply during a state of peace, okay? So the term that is used as far as how to justify going to war legally in international relations is a term called use ad bellum. It's a Latin word, right? Use ad bellum is justification, whether the war is justified or not justified. And then once you're engaged in the war, that's regulated by what is called use in bello, which are the rules of war, right? Okay. So remember we talked about customary law, right? Everybody knew in the countries what were the rules of going to war. They didn't have to pull out a code or a book and read, oh, section one, article two, we can or we cannot do this. It was accepted. These are the things that can be done. Now, because each country is sovereign, right? Meaning it has full authority over its territory, right? And that's what sovereignty means. Sovereignty is supreme authority over territory to the exclusion of other sovereignties over other territories. So that's what's called independence. They're independent of each other. And that's why the country's laws, domestic law, national law, municipal law, they're all the same, only applies to where that country has sovereignty which means only their territory. So when the, 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 the Parliament of Canada passes a law, it only applies to Canadian territory. It does not apply to Mexico. And the same would apply to the U.S. Congress. When the U.S. Congress passes a law, whether called a Joint Resolution of Annexation or the Statehood Act of 1959, it's still limited to U.S. territory. You have to be in that territory in order for that law to have any effect on you. Does that make sense? So when people say, oh, I'm a sovereign, then what you're saying is I'm a king. That's used wrong, right? The sovereign used to be Kamehameha, <laughs> if we're going to use that English word, right? Or we would say manaki iki e, okay? Supreme power, right? Now, that sovereignty of Kamehameha, in 1840, when he created the Constitution, he shared the governing system. He didn't limit his authority. He shared it with the people. But it didn't make the people sovereign. He was still king, but allowed people to participate in government. They can now be elected in the House of Representatives. They can now be appointed in the House of Nobles, right, where they have a say. Did you know in the beginning, when Hawaii is going through its government transformation in 1840, you needed a legislative body called House of Representatives. Did you know that a lot of our people who are Makainano, a commoner, did not want to participate. Because for years, hundreds of years, 
This was always run by the kapu. <laughs> Makainana never made decisions. Ali'i did, right? And when an Ali'i makes a decision, he only made that decision based upon his chief, who, made, who based it upon his chief, who based it upon the king. So Kamehameha the Third had to entice Makainana to come in. It's okay. But that right there was a major change for our people. And then I think a turning point occurred to Makainana in realizing, wow, we have rights. Kamanava, he's a grandfather, a chief of uh, Lili Uokalani and David Kalakawa. In fact, I'm a, I'm a descendant of the chief that assisted him. He actually, uh, he couldn't get a divorce, so he killed his wife, a high chiefess. <laughs> yeah, with Ava, serving Ava, right? Before she died, she said, my husband killed me. Well, everybody heard that. This is already, this is just before the Constitution of 1840 was established, but the Declaration of Rights was there. But also before that, in 1824, Kahumanu declared murder is against the law. So now that forced the Hawaiian government to put a very high-ranking chief on trial. And other chiefs served on the, on the jury. He was found guilty, plus his uh, assistant, that's where I descended from, <laughs> in getting the poison ready, <laughs> prepping the, the poison. Uh, they were all sentenced to death. And at the Honolulu Fort in Honolulu, right, they're actually hung. And they said everybody saw. Now, what do you think was going on in the minds of the chiefs and the people? What do you think the chiefs were thinking? from their perspective. Accountability. <laughs> That's what they were thinking. Not vulnerable, well, they could see as a vulnerability, but they're not looking at, wait a minute, law only came from us, not on us, <laughs> right? Now imagine what the Makainano, the commoners were thinking when they saw this. Wow. <laughs> law outside of the chiefs. So that incident actually, I want to say galvanized, but it had something to, it contributed to Makainana waking up to this new way of governance, right? Which is gradually going to move into a constitutional system where there's going to be checks and balances, where chiefs cannot get away with what they did before, right? So it was an important transition going on. Now, when... Great Britain recognized Hawaii as an independent state in 1843. What they're saying there is that when we, they recognize Hawaii as an independent state, they're saying that only Hawaiian kingdom law applies over Hawaiian territory. This law enacted by the legislature. This law uh, uh, creating court decisions called common law, Hawaiian common law, right? Uh, administrative procedures. It is any British subject in Hawaii is now going to be subject to those laws. Now, a lot of people think, oh, Great Britain recognized Hawaiian independence. What I say is the consequence of that recognition of Hawaiian independence. Because that means a British subject cannot claim protection under British law in Hawaii after 1843. That means the government of Great Britain felt confident enough, right, that Hawaiian law, there was a rule. They weren't going to be abused, right? That's what's important. So to me, the recognition of independence was also the recognition of Hawaiian governance and that it was respectable and that they had confidence that their people can go there. Did you know this did not apply until early 1900, late 1800s, 1899 for sure, in Japan. Did you know that other countries, like let's say Great Britain, were not satisfied that Japan would apply equal protection of the law? Because a lot of it was run by shoguns, very decentralized. So if a British subject gets into trouble in Japan, let's say for murder, he cannot be prosecuted, could not be prosecuted by the Japanese authorities. The British wouldn't allow that. They would have to be prosecuted. He would have to be prosecuted by the British consulate, which is their diplomatic representative in Japan, and that's called consular jurisdiction. So the British consulate would be the court, and they would um, uh, 
um, hold that British subject accountable to the law that most resembles the law that he violated. It wasn't until 1899 that pretty much all the countries accepted Japan's full independence, where they're going to subject their people to Japanese law because it shows their, not their faith, but their confidence in it. Right? Now, an interesting point with Japan in international relations, in 1881, when King Kalako was traveling the world, right? He, he had a meeting with the Meiji Emperor in Japan in 1881. And this meeting was only the Meiji Emperor, Kalakaua, and his foreign, Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the Meiji Emperor asked Kalakaua, because Kalakaua was a part of the family of nations, right? He said, would you be the first power to recognize Japan's full independence? Now that's interesting right there, because here is Japan asking Kalakaua, now the Meiji Emperor, you don't get close to the Meiji Emperor. The Meiji Emperor felt very comfortable with Kalakaua that close. In fact, he looked at, he looked at Kalakaua as a bit higher because he's asking, would you grant full independence to us, recognizing Japanese independence and Japanese law, so the other powers will follow? Well, the, 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 the monarch that ended up doing that was Queen Lili Okalani in 1893. Kalakaua walked, came back home into a firestorm. Bayonet Constitution, you have a lot of political uprising, right? But Lili Okalani, through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Samuel Parker, notified Ambassador Owen, the Hawaiian ambassador in Japan, Tokyo, and it, they, he, he notified the Japanese government on January 18th, 1893, one day after the takeover. The dispatch was sent before January 18th, before January 17th. He received it. Erin went to the foreign minister's office and said, our government is now recognizing Japan's full independence. And that we, the Hawaiian government, rescind consular jurisdiction. You guys caught that? That means the Hawaiian kingdom was prosecuting Hawaiian subjects under Hawaiian kingdom law in Japan for violating Japanese law. So we were just like the British. Can you see where the Meiji emperor was coming from? And for us, being the first power to rescind consular jurisdiction so that any Hawaiian subject, right, irregardless of race, color, creed, ethnicity, Hawaiian members, a nationality, right? You could be Cantonese and be Hawaiian because Hawaiian is short for Hawaiian subject. In fact, Urin was not Kanaka. He was Haole, but he was Hawaiian. And he was representing the Hawaiian kingdom. Any Hawaiian subject prosecute, in trouble in Japan can only be prosecuted under Hawaiian kingdom law. And then we were the first ones to rescind it. Did you know Great Britain followed the very next year, 1894? And then other countries slowly followed until by 1899, right? Japan was recognized as fully independent. It's sort of like what, what um, Palestine is going through right now. Not every country is recognizing Palestine's independence. It's taking time, right? But here Hawaii already got its independence in 1843 because we didn't need all the countries to recognize us as being independent, right? Because we were not a separate country like Japan, right, or China. We we're actually part of the British. In 1843, when Great Britain recognized Hawaiian independence, that was our independence. That was, we needed that recognition. That's like the 13 former colonies of Great Britain called the American colonies. When they got King George III in 1783 in the Treaty of Paris to recognize the 13 independent states who used to be colonies, that's all they needed. They didn't need to get France to recognize. If anything, other countries only recognized their government, not the country. The country was already, was already given birth. But for Japan, because it wasn't a part of another country, it was, a, it was a country of its own, but it just didn't have the recognition of its independence. Remember that customary international law? You needed every single one of them to recognize, right? So can you see our situation was different, but yet we were able to achieve what Japan got in 1899. Okay, so within this system, you have what is called a state of war and a state of peace, right? So when Kalaka was negotiating with the Meiji Emperor, that would be considered during a time of a state of peace, right? Not a state of war. Now, once something triggers a state of war, now the customary law of war kicks in, right?
the customary law, which means at that time, you cannot come with your ship into that war zone, this is, let's say before 1854, because that ship coming in can be considered contraband and taken, even though you have nothing to do with the war. So what countries do is they stay out of the war. That's one of the customs. Stay out and let them fight. Because the law of war is basically conflict resolution at the international level, where both countries become judge, jury, and executioner. And then when they finish the war, they sign a treaty of peace, and then it goes back to a state of peace. Now people can do trade. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what triggers a state of war? Because it still exists today. Because, you know, a state of war uh, is regulated by international law today. But if people are in the military, anybody here former military? Okay. Hey, what's up, Taraldi? <laughs> so if in the, in the military, wars are regulated by the Hague and Geneva Conventions. These are treaties, right? The first Hague Convention was 1899. Then it was superseded by 1907. And then the 1949 Geneva Convention after World War II. Okay. These, these treaties did not create the laws of war and the laws of occupation. All it did was codify it. It put it in a treaty form. So remember the customary law? Everybody knew what the laws of war were. And one of those rules was that the sovereignty of a country cannot be touched until you get a treaty of peace, which you'd conquer them and then have them sign over all their country, but you couldn't say you had title to that property unless you had some evidence recognizable under international law, right? Another aspect of war, if you go to war, okay, and you have to go to war, and it has to be a just war, meaning both sides want to fight. It's not a just war if you're just being invaded, like what Luxembourg was when Germany invaded it in World War II. Okay, that's an unjust war. So you cannot get legality out of an illegality. That's where that term use ad bellum comes in, the justifications for the war. So it's not just somebody got into a fight. How did they get to that point? And if somebody was doing this just to protect themselves and not waging a war where they're going to fight over resources, that aggressor cannot get benefits. Now, if these countries go to war with full knowledge, they're going. Toto to Napoleon is going to take on the other countries and they're going to fight. And they're fighting. What they run the risk of is total subjugation. There's a term called debolatio. Okay, debolatio is where one, cover, one country's military just overwhelms and subdues it. Once they eliminate any power or authority or effectiveness of that army that they're going against, meaning the entire army, they can claim it as theirs. But that is as a result of a just war, <laughs> right? Because if you're going to play war, <laughs> you might lose. And when you lose, you're going to lose badly. What you also had in this state of war concept is what is called neutrality, right? Sort of like how Hawaiians understood Pu'uhonua, okay? Now, let me quickly just touch on, since I brought up Pu'uhonua, which is like a place of refuge, a neutral place, right? Like... Uh, uh, like what we have here, right? So, when we talk about warfare in Hawaii in the past, when we talk about what you need to do when Ali come around or when a Makainana wants something as far as land, that comes under what is called Hawaiian custom, right? Customary law. There was nothing written. It was custom and everybody... In each of the kingdoms of Hawaii, Maui, Oahu, Kauai, they all knew what the laws were, even though nobody, had, no, even though people didn't have a book that said, oh, here's the law. It was custom. So everybody knew what the kapu was and what were the infractions, right? That's an idea of custom. Now, within that custom system, you had war. So when Ali'i fight, they just didn't just go nuts. There was actually protocol, right? There was like setting up the fight between two people first. This was like, we're, we're going to make an agreement where we're going to fight. See, if this was just chaotic, everybody just rush, <laughs> right? No, this was protocol. And within that customary law called Kanavai, right, 
you had what is called places of refuge, places of neutrality. That was understood, where those rules do not apply in that area. Did you know that that is the same concept at the international level in the laws of war? You have what is called neutral territory. Neutral territory. In the 1800s, you had four neutral countries. And what that means is your territory and extending three miles off the coast, if you're in the ocean, is considered neutral territory and neutral territorial seas. What that means is if people are fighting, the British and the French in the North Pacific, right? They can actually come into Hawaiian territory as a neutral country to fix what they got to fix, to gain things that they need to, to get, supplies, but they have to disarm, completely disarm and come in because if they don't disarm, the responsibility of the neutral country is to take them and seize them because that's what international law requires, right? So all other countries know that's a customary rule. So if one country goes in, we know that other country is not giving them support for the war, it's strictly humanitarian, right? And then once they leave the territory, then they refurbish and they go fight. That's neutrality, right? In the 1800s, Hawaii was one of four countries that was recognized as a neutral territory. It's in treaties. Switzerland, nobody knows of Switzerland being neutral, right? Still neutral today. That's because of a treaty, not because of custom, right? Belgium, Belgium in 1800 used to be neutral along with Luxembourg. They're not neutral anymore because they joined the North Atlantic Treaty Organization because of the, Russia, the Soviet threat, right? The fourth country to be considered and recognized as neutral was the Hawaiian Kingdom. That's, that's pretty heavy. So when you think about that, that plays into this laws of war, right? That aspect of neutrality. And it also speaks to as to why Lili Okalani was operating the way she was operating. She wasn't very, she wasn't quick to pull the trigger because that's not how she's supposed to approach it. Yeah, some people say you should have just attacked the Marines. Well, first of all, Hawaii's neutral. You don't do that because then we could effectively lose our neutrality in the future, right? But the queen did what she's supposed to do because she had good advisors. But what's key, she understood international law. We today don't know what that is. We're just learning it, you know, recently, or unless you go to college and learn it, or unless you become a diplomat, right? But it's so important. So, the law of occupation. So the law of occupation is an aspect of the law of war, okay? Now, what triggers the law of war, the laws of war? Use in bello, the laws of war. Some hostile act called an act of war. So I'll give you an example of the four stages of war, right, in international relations. December 7, 1941, Japan, as a country in the family of nations, attacked the U.S. military in Hawaii, okay? That was an act of war, okay? Physical violence between the United States and Japan. That triggered state of war. Now, some people might say, yeah, but Congress didn't declare war. No, no, no. International law is not dependent upon legislative bodies. International law is dependent upon international relations. <laughs> so the act of war is a question of fact, not a question of law, right? And, and that's why um, what's important on here, on this case, with regard to the United States, there was a, um, a naval officer in Pearl Harbor who was killed during the Pearl Harbor attack. And this was a, 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 a lawsuit that went to a federal court where the, the, the family members of this officer, okay, who passed, who died in battle, they were trying to collect insurance from New York Life Insurance. But the contract said uh, what it excluded was death in war. So the family was saying he died on December 7th. It was December 8th that the Congress passed the resolution declaring war on Japan. The judge dismissed that and said, no, no, December 7th was the act of war, which created a state of war. And what happened the next day, December, uh, December 8th, was purely a formality under American law. 
His name was Banyan, Captain Banyan. His family didn't get uh, to collect on the policy because that policy excluded, excluded death during war, right? So that gives you an idea of that first stage, act of war, trigger state of war. Now the, the rules of use in bello, the laws of war apply. One of the main rules, okay, is that country is still sovereign. You don't have title to that territory. All you're doing is fighting the other side physically. And the goal is to subdue that other side so they stop the, the, the violence. And that's called a surrender. Well, December 7, 1941, state of war, first stage, act of war. Second stage, 1941, August, treaty of surrender. Signed on the USS Missouri in Tokyo. USS Missouri is in Pearl Harbor right now, right? General MacArthur is representing the Allied forces. They signed the treaty, basically overthrowing the Japanese government. That did not transform the situation in 1945 to a state of peace. That started the occupation of Japan. Occupation of Japan began 1945. It ended in 1952. General MacArthur, under the rules of law of occupation, was administering Japanese law. Because if you overthrew the government, you temporarily replace that government. But you don't have sovereignty. You have authority. And you must administer the laws of the occupied state. And then in 1951, they were negotiating a treaty of peace in San Francisco. Right? It's the same place where they formed the United Nations. That treaty of peace was then ultimately ratified by the countries and took effect in 1952. 1952, the occupation of Japan ended. Then it went back to a state of peace. So Japan was at war with the United States for 11 years. People didn't know that. 11 years, right? It didn't end in 1945. And some of our kupuna who was in the uh, Second World War, they might have been stationed in Japan from 1945 to 1952. And they could tell you that was the law of occupation. Okay? Now, what takes it into the law of occupation, right? What triggers it? Because the laws of war regulate warfare. So if I'm coming into a country with my military force to take over and do my battle tactics to subdue, right? Because you don't go in war to play. You're there to fight, to win, and people will die. You find the best way to go in. Once, if you're moving into the country, that's called an invasion. An invasion does not trigger uh, law of occupation. It only triggers state of war, right? An invasion. What turns it into the rule of the law of occupation where you have to administer the laws of the occupied country is when you now secure effective control in that territory. You are now in place of that other government. In the case of Japan, that happened in 1945 with the Treaty of Surrender. Allied forces were in complete control of Japanese territory. Now they can implement the law of occupation, right? Now for Hawaii, our invasion of the United, by the United States Marines took place on January 16th, 1893. And President Cleveland referred to that action taken by the Marines in Honolulu said in and of itself was an act of war. He notified the Congress with that term. Now, when a president says act of war, that's exactly what the Japanese did to, Pearl, to the Americans in Pearl Harbor, except ours was no bloodshed. You still had an invasion, right? So when he said act of war, what did President Cleveland trigger? State of war. That's what he triggered. Next day, Queen Lili Okalani signs a conditional surrender, just like the Japanese signed one in 1945. A conditional surrender, calling upon the president to investigate the rogue actions of his ambassador and Captain Wilts of the USS Boston. That surrender merely initiated what aspect of the law of occupation? Oh, I just said it. <laughs> it activated the law of occupation because now they're in effective control. And what the United States did was they were effectively controlling Hawaii's territory through a proxy that they set up as a puppet government called the Provisional Government. And that's what President Cleveland said in his message. He said that the Provisional Government owes its existence. Now, these are the words now he used. The Provisional Government owes its existence to an invasion by the United States. You see the terms that he's using in this message. These are laws of war terms. This is not state of peace. 
that's what's important to know. So since 7, January 17th, 1893, we have been occupied by the United States. First, through its proxy called the Provisional Government, changing its name to the Republic in 1894, then renaming itself to the Territory of Hawaii, and then renaming itself to the State of Hawaii. That's why the law of occupation applies. Any questions up to this point? You guys following me? Is it good? You sure? Okay, I'm watching you guys' eyes now. When I see some people going cross eyed like, oh, okay, let me explain it again. <laughs> Any questions so far? You guys see the difference between domestic law and international law, right? Okay, so this is a really good book. The International Law of Occupation, 2012. Yael Ben Vinisti, okay, he's Israeli. Very good. He's not an apologist for the Israeli government in Palestine. He's an academic scholar on the law of occupation. Good stuff. He even makes certain reference in here uh, to Hawaii. Yeah, very subtle. Yeah, the occupation of Hawaii. Then he goes on. Because <laughs> actually I was in communication with him when I was going through my doctoral dissertation. Because I was sending him information. Because the whole purpose here is to expose, right? Now... Um, well, this is his book, The International Law of Occupation. But one of the, the arbitrators in the Lance Larson versus Hawaiian Kingdom case at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, his name is Professor Christopher Greenwood. Uh, he actually wrote, an, uh, 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 I think it was a book, on the 100th anniversary of the Hague Convention. He was the expert on the, on the Hague Convention. You had a question? Ah, okay, perfect. Good question. Okay, so the term prescription under, okay, so prescription today would be considered adverse possession, right? You occupy territory, the other side does not protest, and through time, let's say 20 years, you accrue a right to file a quiet title action, okay? And you can prove those guys slept on their rights. They didn't say anything, right? So, well, it'll be a quiet title action in order to secure adverse possession. But you have to get the 20-year uh, period because somebody else owns the property. On, somebody, has, somebody else has the deed. <laughs> but somebody's paying the taxes and nobody's protesting. If 20 years lapse and nobody says anything, that is an indication. And even in the Hawaiian Kingdom, they had that type of a law. But it wasn't called uh, adverse possession. It was called um, peaceful uh, prescription. That's the term they used. So... If you don't protest, that's a sign that, that you have forsaken your title. But then you still got to get an order <laughs> from a judge to confirm that. You just can't move on after 20 years, right? In international law, right? And a lot of international law is drawn from laws of countries, right? Of each country. They make their way into the international level. And one of those terms is what you brought up called prescription. So prescription is where... A country can occupy the territory of another country, a portion of it, and if that other country doesn't protest, then they're basically saying they're acquiescing to that other country's presence, right? I'll give you an example of that. Uh, so in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican-American War, created the Rio Grande as the new dividing point, right? In Mexico, I mean, uh, sorry, in Mexico, there's a city called Juarez. Juarez is right across the river from, anybody know? El Paso. El Paso. Okay. What ends up happening is the river in the late 1880s began to naturally move into Mexican territory and create 600 acres called the Chamazal Tract, dry land, right? Texans began to slowly move into that territory and build homes. As soon as they, the Mexicans saw that, they filed protests with the U.S. government. This is, we need to renegotiate the border because it no longer can be the river. It has to be on land now. The United States didn't do anything about it until the early 1900s. They entered into an agreement with Mexico to create 
an arbitrational tribunal under international law to resolve the dispute. The United States claim was acquisitive prescription. You guys didn't say anything. The tribunal rejected that, said no. Mexico protest, protested. They didn't have to continue to protest where it could lead to a war <laughs> in order to preserve their protests. It was rejected. And it wasn't until President Kennedy that they had to deal with the consequences of the arbitral award. The point that I'm making is that failed, right? You needed, uh, so if, if there's any protest against an encroaching country, it will preclude any claim to prescription or acquisition, right? Now, from an international law standpoint though, right? You got what is called the state of peace and a state of war, right? And then when in a state of war, you got the law of occupation. Where do you think any prescriptive claim can be made by one country against another? During what state of affairs? Can they make that claim during a state of war? They can only do it during a state of peace. Hawaii's been in a state of war with the United States since January 17, 1893. They can't claim prescription. Wrong state of affairs. So you see how you got to know... Where you at <laughs> in order to respond? Now, speaking to that, just that, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a perfect segue to what I was going to get into. <laughs> so I said, brother, right on. <laughs> FM 27-10. U.S. Army Field Manual 27-10. The Law of Land Warfare. Okay? You guys can actually Google this on Google Books, right? You can get a copy of it. Under... Uh, Under chapter six, occupation. So it gets into the rules of occupation, right? Section 358, okay? Under the laws of occupation, meaning state of war. This is what it says. Now keep in mind on what we just covered about prescription. Section 358, occupation does not transfer sovereignty. Being an incident of war, remember the act of war? Being an incident of war, military occupation confers upon the invading force the means, of ex the means of exercising control for the period of occupation. It does not transfer the sovereignty to the occupant, but simply the authority or power to exercise some of the rights of the sovereignty, meaning it's still separate. The exercise of these rights results from the established power of the occupant. Remember, effective control. From the necessity of maintaining law and order indispensable to both the inhabitants and to the occupying force. It is therefore unlawful for a belligerent occupant to annex occupied territories or to create a new state therein while hostilities are still in progress. So actually the state of war just took out every action the United States tried to do with Hawaii in claiming it annexed it. But the first thing that we have, but they had to do was to change the narrative so you folks don't even know what international law is and we're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> Once you bark up this tree, now you can cite Section 358, <laughs> Article 43, uh, Hague Convention, Article 64, Geneva Convention. And all of that is merely a codification of the law of occupation. Make sense? You guys good? It's a big crowd. Sorry, you guys got to stand up. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll go. That I don't know offhand. But the time they, they took the flag down and they put the American flag up, that was in 1898, August 12th. Actually, what happened was everything is 1893, January 17th. And that's what we have to keep in mind. It's not what they did or didn't do after 1893. It's what they were supposed to have done in accordance with the rules. Right now, we are, we're all being informed with what are the rules, right? And these rules are important to know, very important. And it's just to provide a context, right? It's not trying to say, oh, we're military. No, we're just following the rules. We're neutral. This is a neutral country. Yes? What if a given government doesn't apply by international law? <laughs> Perfect. Okay, and you know what? 
that is a perfect segue. into the other section of FM 27-10. Chapter 8, Remedies for Violation of International Law called War Crimes. And that's our next class. <laughs> that's what we're covering on our next class. But today, yeah, right after this class. So it starts at 10.45. <laughs> Actually, yeah, 10.45. So we started late earlier. Yeah, so, ju so, June, so June 16th was an attempt. Again, now keep in mind, it's all illegal under the laws of occupation, right? So this is just for, from a historical standpoint on these events. So January, June 16th, 1897, the Republic of Hawaii, who used to be called the Provisional Government, which was a proxy of the United States. The United States admitted they created it. Its existence relies on an invasion by the United States. They signed a treaty with the United States claiming to transfer Hawaii to the United States. Now, right off the bat, in what we discussed, what state of affairs was that being done or perceived to have been done under? State of war or state of peace? No? They were trying to do it like it's a state of peace. They're entering into a treaty like the Louisiana Purchase, just transferring Hawaii. Because they have to hide the fact that what happened in 1893 was an invasion and President Cleveland admitted it was an act of war that created this whole thing. Well, they're like, it's like, it's like somebody talking Greek when it's actually French. And as long as they keep talking Greek, they think it's going to be Greek. No, it's still French. It doesn't matter what you say. So the treaty that they signed had no legal effect, but it had a political effect, right? Had a political effect. And that's why the very next day, June 17th, 1897 is when Queen Lili Okalani fought a diplomatic protest. So she even had to play with these people that are playing with this, this, this game of like they're a legitimate government, right? And then that's what led to the signature petition. So it had to activate our people to protest against the attempt to annex by a treaty. Again, when you can't, but they're going to try, and they managed to kill the treaty. And that's what prompted them to now come out with a joint resolution of annexation and say, okay, you know what, we're not following any rules. We're just passing a law, we got you. That happened because of political activism by Hawaiian subjects who knew how to play that game in America and, and, and basically uh, throw a monkey wrench in the machine. And then they finally said, let's just take it. Okay, now we're coming back and asking the right questions because now we're saying, wait a minute, we have first accepted you took it or you acquired it and that's why we say today ceded lands we treat it like the state of hawaii is legal right i actually work for the state of hawaii which is illegal as being a faculty member at the university of hawaii and then i get paid from pillage monies from you folks because it's called taxes see when you throw the, the 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 state of affairs in the right alignment oh that's what everybody goes wait, 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 wait this thing is getting too close to me now i thought this was all about them called those guys who overthrew it in 1893 guess what we all are in their shoes whether you're Maka'i, yeah? whether you're Ahamana, whether you're Kupuna, whether you're Luahine, whether you're uncle from California, we all caught in this. And the only way you can get out of this web is to know what's going on. Well, that's, and this is where we're going to get to the remedy. Right. So remember, FM 27-10. This section is chapter eight, remedies for violation of international law, war crimes, remedies, okay? Everybody should go online, Google FM 27-10 and go read them. Google, map, uh, Google books, right? Just look it up. Because this is good stuff, right? Okay, so what we're talking about here is not ending the occupation. What I'm talking about is bringing compliance to the law of occupation, right? Because the compliance to the law of occupation will bring about the end of the occupation. You don't jump to say, get out of here when everything is all messed up because after 100 years of brainwashing, you're going to clean up your mess. 
We're dealing with denationalization on an unbelievable scale. We don't, it's like, if, if you think we're going to end the occupation, that's like going from the frying pan to the boiling pot. Because nobody knows even what is the law. <laughs> so this is where things need to be understood. So it's compliance. So the first step to address the violation of the law of occupation is to bring compliance to the law of occupation. And one way to bring compliance to the law of occupation is to show certain violations. Now, after World War II, well, actually after World War I, began a process under international law that for the first time did not rely on violations to be dealt with by the countries themselves who held immunity by their, from their actions because they represented the, the government. And they're at war, and if it was an atrocity taking place, it would be an issue of reparations and not holding that individual general or that sergeant accountable for mass murder. That didn't happen until after World War II, uh, World War I. World War I, the, the Commission on Responsibilities was formed. After World War I ended in 1918, they fought for four years, 1914 to 1918. In 1919, they came up with war crimes. They're now going to hold individuals accountable for the violations during World War I, namely uh, the Kaiser. <laughs> Yeah, the German head of state. That was unheard of in the past of holding heads of state accountable for actions taken by their military, right? So they came up with these, a list of, of, of war crimes. Mass murder. Um, one particular one is uh, attempt to denationalize the inhabitants of occupied territory. Because the Germans were doing that along with the Bulgarians. And, the, and also Romania, right? So, so they are identifying these war crimes. What you start to see is international law is now moving toward holding individuals accountable and not just countries accountable, right? Because you can't put a country in jail, but you can put somebody, a person in jail. You can hang somebody. You can't hang a country. Then World War II broke out. Major atrocity, worse atrocities taking place. Okay, that, that's what led to um, the prosecution in Nuremberg, right? These Nazis, okay? Now, that eventually led to what was called establishing the 1949 Geneva Convention because the 1907 Hague Regulations pretty much only focused on the, country, on the government and what they're supposed to do with occupation and the laws of war. It didn't really address the civilians on the receiving end of the violence, that wasn't made clear until after World War II because of the German atrocities. And that's what led to the Geneva Convention of 1949, where they're now going to be identifying certain violations of international law and call it grave breaches of international law, which would eventually come to be known as war crimes, specific stuff. So within FM 27-10, under section 499, War crimes. The term war crime is the technical expression for a violation of the law of war by any person or persons, military or civilian. Every violation of the law of war is a war crime. Now, what are these war crimes? What are these laws? One is uh, destruction of property. If property belongs to another party, whether the, another, whether the country that is occupied or private party, did you know going on to that territory... That property without consent and digging it up, that's a war crime. That's destruction of property. So Mauna Kea and TMT is an attempt to destroy. The previous telescopes, evidence of destruction. You guys see that? Now what you also have to have with, with uh, war crimes is, and, and some of you may have seen this with uh, Donald Trump and the Mueller report. In order for someone to commit a crime, they have to have what is called a guilty mind. So it's, it's a term called mens rea, right? Mens rea is they know what they're doing is illegal, and they still do it. So you know that first volume of uh, the Mueller report? Basically, what Mueller said was Donald Trump and his campaign people had no clue what they were doing, so they couldn't be hit with a crime of conspiracy. But they definitely were in collusion. <laughs> it's called another word that others have called it, useful idiots. And, 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 and that's not a crime, though. 
Now, when you get into obstruction of justice, which is the second volume, see, now you're starting to get into the state of mind of the president and now deliberately blocking. See, that is a criminal aspect, right? So for somebody to be prosecuted or to be held liable under war crimes for destruction of property, they have to have mens rea. They had to know that what they're going to do is a destruction of property. Not that they have to believe it. They just have to be aware of it because it goes into intent. Yeah. If somebody just went up there and built it because they never know, you can't hold them accountable. So like the ones that built it already, I can't, I, 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 I maybe I don't, I, I probably can't find any evidence that they actually knew that they were destroying property. So that would make it a war crime, but it's still illegal. Probably subject to reparations. Yeah. I had another question. Yes. Okay, so before I get there, I want to read the remedies, right? So what I'm saying is this is the outcome. And, and destruction of property is a war crime. Um, denationalization is a war crime. But you have to intentionally denationalize the children. Today, there's no intent to denationalize because you got somebody who has been denationalized, <laughs> denationalizing other people. You can't say he was like from... 1906 with the territorial government knowing they're denationalizing so you can see it's still illegal but it's not a crime right so first thing before we get into pointing the figure fingers at everybody because that's what i don't want to do right because a lot of people are doing things out of pure ignorance and it's our own people it's not like we're facing the makai that's uh they came from 1893 that's my cousin that's my uncle that's my friend it's like now they caught right and that now we're caught so let's kind of step back from that. How do you provide remedies in light of all of that? Yeah, that's the first step, right? I'm not excusing any conduct. I'm just kind of, let's get in perspective. So chapter 8, section 495, remedies of injured belligerent. So when you say belligerent, in the law of occupation, we're a belligerent state only because we're in a state of war. It doesn't mean we have to fight and shoot, but we have rights as a belligerent state. Yeah, I got 10 minutes. Okay. In the event of violation of the law of war, the injured party may legally resort to remedial action of the following types. First, publication of the facts with the view to influencing public opinion against the offending belligerent state. Publication of the facts. Social media. But you got to rely on information that is accurate. Right? We're going to get into that. You got to spread it. Publication, get the word out, okay? Because the first thing is to expose, not to attack. You got to get the word out. B, second, protest and demand for compensation and or punishment of the individual offenders. War crimes. Investigations. Third, solicita solicitation of the good offices, mediation, or intervention of neutral countries for the purpose of making the enemy observe the laws of war. So what you're seeing here is the move toward compliance, but it starts off with exposure. And the fact that we've been talking the wrong language all these years is an indication of the confusion. Now when somebody brings in the law of occupation, somebody says, yeah, but don't we have indigenous rights? At the international level, they're looking at that going, what are you? Are you a colonized people? Because if you're a colonized people, the law of occupation doesn't apply. And if you're an occupied people, how come they're saying they're colonized? You, you, you see that. So we have to accept responsibility ourselves with the fact that now we know. And that, have, that has us, it, it requires us to take affirmative steps to address that ignorance without lashing out, right? So war crimes can be done through an investigation, just like the Mueller report, lays out all the evidence with the evidence, with the mens rea, the guilty mind, right? With the, uh, uh, what is called actus reus, that's a term for conduct or action directly tied to the violation. Because you need to show they knew what they were doing. We actually have evidence of that in the courts. One of the war crimes is denying a protected person a fair trial. Dexter Kayama, was arguing cases in the court since 2011. And these judges were openly admitting 
you're right, but I can't do that. Because I would launch what is called an atomic bomb. Yeah, that's on the record. Okay, the problem is you got a victim right there who's the defendant, and you just justify taking that person's house because you don't want to do this. That, that right there is mens rea and actus reus directly tied. They know what they're doing is wrong, but they're not going to take that position because I'm going to destroy everything. Well, it, don't blame Dexter for delivering the truth, <laughs> you know. So you have a lot of cases like that where the record is set. Now, with what's going on in Mauna Kea, what I haven't seen, right, was anybody on record talking about Hawaii being occupied. You guys noticed that, huh? A lot of it was based on sacred site. Sacredness of the mountain. That's true. But you're not triggering something. See, they don't know. They don't know. I try to explain it how many times I come up to start speaking the right language, but it hasn't happened. So now that it's coming to this point, war crimes are not an issue here. But still violations of international law are. So there's a difference between the war crime and the illegality of the action, right? That's the point I'm making. But I want to draw attention not to the people that may be doing what they're doing here, Maka'i. Let's talk about at the highest level, okay? Tamara Paulton, a councilwoman from Maui, drafted a letter, drafted a letter to President Lasner before the arrest. And she had asked me, what are my thoughts on Mauna Kea? And I came at it from an international law standpoint. If you guys get a chance, go get, get a copy of her letter online. And you're going to read what I wrote, which you now can better understand after you sat in this class. Because <laughs> at first, I think people might be going, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> it was to uh, President Lasner from the University of Hawaii. So what you can do is uh, Google... Um, Tamara Paulton, T-A-M-A-R-A, -A Paulton, P-A-L-T-I-N. So based upon what I advised her, I said, this area, which is where the construction is going to take place, is in the ahupu of Kaohe. Kaohe, on the Hawaiian Kingdom Law, belongs to the government. That's public land. This area that we're sitting here is Humu'ula. This is an ahupu of Humu'ula, which is crown land. That legally belongs to the crown land commissioners. Okay, so the point is, Kaohe, if you're going to go up there or even through this road, you need the consent of the Crown Land Commissioners from the Kingdom era. And to build on Mauna Kea, you need the consent of the Minister of the Interior from the Hawaiian Kingdom government. What happened to the Hawaiian government in 1893? Got overthrown. So how do you get their, how do you get their consent? You can't, they're not around. So you have to follow the laws of occupation. And in one of the laws, it says property owned by the state or, pri pri or by private people cannot be taken or destroyed unless due to military necessity, you're being attacked. So that rule applies here, even though we have nobody here to speak on behalf of these owners of the land. It's international law that tells you where you're supposed to get that authority. So all of a sudden, we are all protected by the mere fact that our government was overthrown. How's that? The irony of all ironies. It's like the Hawaiian kingdom went into a cocoon. <laughs> Pretty soon it's opening up. It's going to come out. It's full blossom. Wings spread. Not yet. Occupation of an end yet. <laughs> but almost there. So she sent it to President Lasner. The reason is Lasner entered into a sublease with TMT. Now, the authority of Lasner to enter into that sublease with TMT is based upon a lease that the state of Hawaii did with the University of Hawaii in 1968 that transferred 11,000 acres under a lease to the University of Hawaii, which led to the building of the other telescopes. The problem is those lands that the state said they leased to the uh, UH, they got it from the United States Congress in 1959, the Statehood Act. And then the United States Congress got it in 1898 by a joint resolution. Oh, record scratch. 1898 joint resolution didn't transfer anything. Right? That's not a treaty. So everything stops. So every, there is no authority coming to date. 
So when you when you talk about war crimes, that letter from Tamara, the council member, was also carbon copy to the governor. I believe to the Hawaii County Council members. Uh, there's a bunch of them. You guys can take. I I I can't recall who or all of them. That means, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so. So that was sent off, and basically, tomorrow's asking President Lazna, if you don't believe in the information I've got from Dr. Sai with all these facts, have your legal counsel refute it, because we're dealing with illegalities, and that building the telescope is a war crime. It's destruction of property. And what prompted her to do this is Goodfellow Company, which is the construction company going to build, they're from Maui. That falls under her purview. That's why she wrote the letter. You know, what goes on here belongs to Hawaii County, but Ma but Goodfellow is from Maui. So, Lasner ended up responding by not responding, saying, uh, the governor is taking care of issues up there. That That's not what she asked. So she followed up with another letter saying, you obviously agree with me <laughs> that, that there's a defect in the title. And again, if that's not the case, please have your legal counsel <laughs> address this. She just received another letter a couple weeks ago, last week, that said, uh, well, we went through all the permitting process, and it's okay. You notice how they're evading from that, because if this is all frivolous, wouldn't it be so simple for the corporation counsel or, or the attorney for the university to say, no, he's wrong on this, 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 bingo. That shows you the strength of the information, but the non-compliance, which could lead to certain issues. Governor Ige and President Lasner cannot say they never know. That letter proves it. Also, the response by Lasner shows he's engaging. This is not just some post on Facebook sent to somebody who you don't know read it. <laughs> so that has consequences in and of itself, right? Now, under Section 509, Defense of Superior Orders. The fact that the law of war has been violated pursuant to an order of a superior authority, whether military or civil, does not deprive the act in question of its character of a war crime. Nor does it constitute a defense in the trial of an accused individual unless he did not know and could not reasonably have been expected to know what the act ordered was unlawful. So one thing we had in the Army Guard, in the Army, same training, unlawful orders. If there is a makai or law enforcement or somebody who's going to have a sidearm that's going to be carrying out something and they watch this video on YouTube, this is how you address it, you deal with it. In fact, I was contacted by a, 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 a army personnel deployed in the former Yugoslavia. It's like this YouTube has really attracted a lot of our people all over the world. And because he, he found out I was former military, got out as a captain, he was asking me specific questions. What if he comes home after the deployment and he is activated to be a part of the uh, reactionary force? He, some, some reactionary force. I forgot the, the, the first word. Um, he said, what should I do? Now, that's a real good question, right? And he's coming from Yugoslav the former Yugoslavia. They're monitoring what's going on in Hawaii. What I told him was, and by the way, he's an NCO, non-commissioned officer. He's not a private. And he said, in this, he said, uh, uh, Dr. Sai, how do, we, how do I approach this? I said, first of all, do not challenge orders because you break down the chain of command, right? But if you determine that the order is unlawful, so if it's an order to allow an, a group to go up there to commit a crime, that's an unlawful order. And that as an unlawful order, you have every responsibility to stand down. And say, until you can prove to me it's not an unlawful order, I got to stand down. Because if I follow through knowing it's an unlawful order, superior orders are not a defense. And this came out of Vietnam. Lieutenant Cali and the My Lai incident. That's what we were trained in the Army. A lot of times when the lieutenant was, well, when the lieutenant was given an order, raise the village with machine gun fire. 
He did. In his trial, he said, I was just following an order. That was an unlawful order because those were civilians that you mowed down his platoon. A lot of that was ingrained in the training after Vietnam as officers. So that's what I went through, right? So when we're looking at this, and I need to bring it to a close, this is an introduction into the laws of war and, and the remedies. We have to be careful who we say are committing war crimes because they have to have intent. And it's very unfair to allege somebody committing war crimes when they didn't commit it, although their action would, be, would constitute unlawful, but not a crime, right? These things are, are developing, right? There's a lot of things in motion. In fact, I have in my possession a legal opinion that was done at my request, representing what is called the Commission of Inquiry. Professor Shabas from uh, London, he is the foremost authority on the laws of on uh, international criminal law and war crimes. He is. In fact, he has over 500 publications. How's that? Shabbos. Yeah. It, you, it, things will start to come out in, in its time, right? He identified what are the alleged war crimes that apply to Hawaii and what are the elements of each of those crimes and what is the mens rea, the guilty mind, and the actus reus, the conduct or action that has a nexus to the crime itself that would create criminal liability. He basically provided what is the checklist on war crimes and criminal liability. Now I can assure you, somebody of this stature would not have done this if it wasn't real, because he would affect his, his uh, reputation because he is the expert on war crimes. And it's not putting blame on anybody. He just laid out, these are the rules that apply. Whoever they are, this is the checklist. And there's another person that's going to be providing me a legal opinion on human rights violations and self-determination of an occupied people, not a colonized people. Very different approach. He's from a university in Italy. Okay? So a lot of these things are taking place. What I wanted to do here was, in light of the possibility of what may happen, people need to kind of stand down, right? People need to be careful. So I would recommend just follow the... the the advice of Dexter Kayama here on, on what to do. Don't create an incident because what's important here is by getting arrested does not settle the issue. Did you know war crimes have no statutes of limitation? There is no statute of limitation. That's why they can still hunt Nazis today in South America. There is no statute of limitation. So we have to be very careful how we do this and our own people that are about to enforce need to know what are their procedures and their protocol with regard to a lawful order. Lawful order. And I would recommend that if you folks should find yourself in a situation, pose the question, do you know that this is an unlawful order that you're doing? See, that's something that you could respond with, right? Without agitating anything. And if it comes down, it comes down, but as long as the record are being record set. Because people have to be held accountable. You know, law is law, accountability is another thing. And international law and accountability are very different than how you would expect it here. You call the police to enforce the law. Yeah. And with that, I'm getting the, the word. I got to end. <laughs> I want to thank you folks for sitting in. Mahalo nui. Aloha. <laughs> Remember, FM 27-10, look it up. Google. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>